Thank you so much. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk here. And I would uh, like to start by apologizing uh, for the fact that I do have a cuff, so I might pause a couple of times. And also <coughs> the fact that uh, this work uh, is mostly, uh, you know, uh, this talk is mostly about a review of the entire field uh, uh, of uh, how people have dealt about the problem of thermalization in ADS-3 CFT2 over the past three, four years. And um, uh, so many of you all might already be familiar with it. But uh, still, let me begin by uh, introducing what the problem is. Um, the problem we want to describe is that of thermalization in ADS-3 CFT2. Uh, CFT as a quantum field theory is a unitary theory. Black holes, on the other hand, uh, from the ADS CFT dual, are uh, some thermal states in, uh, descri you know, described by some thermal states in the CFT. Uh, from considerations of unitarity, we know that you know if you unitarily evolve a pure state, it cannot go to some sort of a mixed state. So there are cases in <coughs> this duality where you can start with some sort of a you know shell of matter that is described by a pure state in the CFT, and uh, under certain considerations, they can collapse to form a black hole. Now, how do you describe uh, the physics that's going on in the CFT in those scenarios? Uh, so the question that we are trying to <coughs> describe uh, is, is uh, that especially. The right kind of setup for understanding these sort of models would have been a, a real collapse scenario where you would have a, you know, a shell of matter that's falling in um, uh, and forming a black hole, and uh, then trying to understand what the physics is from the boundary point of view. But it's been seen that uh, you know, analytic calculations in these scenarios get um, you know, very quickly complicated. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to understand some basic toy setups which are available to us uh, in ADS-3 CFT2 especially, which, where there are black holes that are dual to pure states. And we want to understand how to uncover some thermal physics from these pure states, just to understand you know, this problem in its entirety. <coughs> <clears throat> so let's begin by um, describing what is called the thermophile double state. Now, the thermophile double state uh, is a very old construction. Uh, it's, uh, the basic idea is, uh, in the case of CFTs, is that if we take two uncoupled copies of the CFT, each with a, at a finite temperature given by beta inverse, then you can create a, you know, a, a state out of entangling these two particular CFTs in this particular fashion. Uh, the psi is the thermophile double state. The z beta is the partition function of the individual CFTs. And um, in the bulk, this state is called the hartle hawking israel state. But from the po point of view of the boundary, it's, still, it's called the thermophile double state. Um, this construction is simple, but let me define some properties of this particular state. This state is completely pure. That's very easy to check. Uh, this uh, density matrix that has been defined using this state, if you sort of square this, this will give you the density matrix back. Uh, one of the very intriguing properties of this particular uh, <clears throat> construction is that if you take the full density matrix and if you trace over one of the CFTs, all of the deg uh, degrees of freedom of one of the CFTs, you, what you'll get is a thermal CFT, <coughs> or a thermal density matrix corresponding to the second CFT, telling you that the two participating, uh, you know, uh, entities in this state are thermal quantities. Um, the physical interpretation of this sort of construction is that one CFT is acting as some sort of a heat bath for the other CFT. Um, okay, so <coughs> this is uh, sometimes also uh, referred to as a purification of a thermal state. In this case, the purification is done by uh, a system that has exactly the number of degrees of freedom and is exactly the same system as the system under consideration. So uh, oh, some other properties which follow from the properties that I just described is that you, know, you can consider an operator on the first CFT and you can uh, calculate its expectation value. The first CFT is in a thermal state. So of course, uh, the expectation value would be given by this. But now consider the expectation value in the thermal field double state. And it will give you back exactly the same expectation value as in the thermal state. Uh, that's just because you know the second, uh, you know the degrees of freedom of the second CFT, or rather the density matrix of the second CFT, doesn't at all interfere in this expectation value. So this indicates that uh, calculating e traces in density matrices can be reduced to calculating expectation values in thermophile double states, uh, which in this case are pure states. So 
<coughs> what is the ADS dual of this thermophile double state? Well, there was a construction that was suggested in the year 2001 in a, in a paper called Eternal Black Holes in anti Deciduous Spaces, where he said that um, you, know, you can take in D, ADS D plus 1 CFT D, you can take two uh, Schwarzschild black holes uh, with their own CFT duals, and you can try and uh, entangle them in a particular fashion, and that would uh, give you uh, a, a dual for this thermophile double state. Uh, there's a little bit more to that uh, as to how to entangle these two thermophile doubles. In the, you know, uh, <coughs> these black holes, well, the, the Penrose diagram for these black holes are just the maximally extended Schwarzschild diagrams, uh, what you also refer to as the eternal black hole. Um, uh, you have the CFT1 living in this region, the CFT2 living in this region, uh, in the second boundary, the first boundary, and uh, the exteriors of the two black holes are completely shielded from one another because of the horizons that are present here. So any, any observer which is sitting in region 1 will, not, will be completely oblivious to whatever is happening in region 4 and vice versa, region uh, 3 and vice versa. <coughs> but this is still not the dual for the thermophile double state for the simple reason that we have not entangled the two black holes. Uh, the entanglement was, uh, the, the prescription for the entanglement was give, uh, give, as given by Maldasena was that what you do is you take the eternal black hole state, you consider one slice, which is a time symmetric slice. For simplicities, you can, uh, <coughs> simplifying the case, you can just consider the t equal to zero slice. You cut the black hole there. So you get, you're left with somewhat uh, a, a half a, a, an eternal black hole. Now you take the thermophile double state in the boundary, which is like a Euclidean state, and it's corresponding a uh, Hartle-Hawking state in the bulk, and you glue these two geometries together. This thermophile double uh, you know, state will create an entangled uh, state, not just in the boundary, but also in the bulk. The construction would look something like this. You know, this is the thermophile double state living on the boundary, the Hartle-Hawking state in the bulk, and this is half of the eternal black hole. One another way to look at this entire construction is just that you, know, you can consider at t equal to 0 that there is a wave function that has been created, which creates two CFTs, uh, you know, two CFTs and two entangled black holes simultaneously. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects now is that you know, the interior of the black hole would be accessible to you. And all the interesting time-dependent physics come from this interior itself. That is what uh, where uh, we would also find interesting. Uh, all, would all uh, all of our interests interests would lie in? Um, uh, let me go on for two more minutes uh, about uh, what this um, uh, state is like now. The thermoph in the thermophile double state, of course, the two-point correlation functions are non-zero because. Uh, uh, because of the entanglement that has been that that is present in the states, however, uh, the two CFTs are completely uncoupled, so the uh, you know the commutator is zero between them. Um, <coughs> now, the bulk that we have described, of course, must mirror these properties, and we we are interested in understanding how the bulk would mirror these particular properties. That you know, uh, how would it uh, sort of allow for uh, non-local correlation functions? Uh, that have been generated because of the presence of entanglement, how would it you know, mirror these properties, um, uh, this construction mirror these properties? And the solution was, again, you know, uh, was suggested by Malasena and Suskind in a paper in 2013, um, where they conjectured the idea of what is called the ER equal to EPR. Um, the ER here refers to an Einstein-Rosen bridge through the bulk. In the layman's terms, this is also this also can be uh, called a wormhole uh, living in, inside the bulk, joining the uh, right exterior of the black hole to the left exterior. And uh, EPR refers to entanglement. Uh, it's exactly the same equation that we wrote about. Uh, I, I must just go back once to explain how this follows from this. Well, this ideally should have been 0, because these are two operators that are living on two CFTs that are completely decoupled. However, it is not zero because of the entangle, entangled state in which you are calculating the correlation function. So this equation completely follows from this, um, this equation where you, know, you have non-local correlation functions between operators living on two completely decoupled CFTs, and that is completely happening because of entanglement. 
And in the ER equal to EPR paradox, the, it's, it's, it's not a paradox, uh, ER equal to EPR conjecture, you're trying to explain this behavior from the bulk. Um, what is a picture like? The picture is exactly like this. You have a CFT on the right-hand side. You have a CFT on the left-hand side. This is the, these are the smooth horizons. And uh, what happens is that these pathways open up in the bulk when there's an entanglement between the two sides. And so there can be you know, space-like geodesics that start running from, this here, from the right boundary to the left boundary right through the bulk. And this is the way in which uh, you know, O1, O2 expectation value being non-zero can be realized. This was the idea. And, and as you can see here now, now you can have geodesics that are actually accessing the interior of the black hole. This is one of the most important and interesting features that we would want to you know, explore. So <clears throat> it's important to quantify the conjecture at any point. And one of the ways it, uh, in which one quantify the conjecture is by calculating entanglement between various degrees of freedom on the left and the right. Uh, what uh, Malice and Hartman did in 2013 were that, was that they took um, uh, a single interval on the left, and left boundary and this, an interval of the same size on the right boundary, and they tried to calculate the uh, correlation functions, uh, sorry, the entanglement between these degrees of freedom from the CFT and from the bulk. They wanted to match these results in, uh, in order to show that these pathways actually exist and that there are smooth horizons in the bulk that exist. Uh, <clears throat> in the CFT, this calculation is, uh, well, okay. Uh, before that, I must say that, uh, you know, uh, the kind of slices uh, which one has to choose, which, which, were, which I just uh, showed in the previous slide, the kind of slices that uh, would access these regions has to live in a time-dependent um, thermophile double state. Now, the thermophile double state uh, was a state that was, um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, this was the thermophile double state. Now, if you see, if you uh, you see that if I act on this with uh, an operator which is of the form e to the power h1 minus h2, it's going to give me zero. That's h1 minus h2 times t. It would give me zero because h1 would give you an eigenvalue and h2 would give you the same eigenvalue because these two states have are the you know, these two are the same copies. The Hamiltonians are the same on either CFT. But if you act on it with uh, some Hamiltonian, which is H1 plus H2, then uh, you will get a time-dependent thermophile double state. Um, so these kind of geodesics can be created by considering uh, forward time evolution on this CFT and forward time evolution on this CFT simultaneously. So in this sort of a state, while you're evolving the thermophile double by an H1 plus H2 Hamiltonian, uh, you, uh, <coughs> one wishes to calculate the entanglement entropy of uh, finite regions on the left and the right boundary. And um, uh, well, let me show you the expression first. The expression here is the following. So on the left boundary, you insert a twist and an anti-twist operator to calculate the Rennie entropy on the left boundary. You computer twist and an anti-twist operator. Uh, I need not go into explaining what entanglement entropy uh, calculations are like because uh, you know, Sunil already gave a talk yesterday explaining that. Um, but what I want to say is how can you reduce calculating expectation values in the thermophile state to some expectation value calculation uh, on a single CFT? The way to do that is to keep in mind that the state actually has a Euclidean section. So what you can consider is you can consider that there are two CFTs that are living on a single Euclidean circle, but are separated by beta by two um, in, in, this particular, you know, in this particular way. So you have a CFT that's living on this side, and uh, you consider an interval on this, uh, uh, on this side, but you have another CFT that's living beta by two apart in, in the Euclidean time direction. And uh, if you consider that, then you can bring the two intervals on the same CFT. And now what you have is that you have a four-point correlation function on a single CFT, where these two uh, have their own sigma and tau, uh, sigma, uh, you know, space and time dependencies, each of these operators. Uh, but <laughs> these operators additionally have a Euclidean time dependence which is beta by two different from these operators. Okay, so <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. 
<coughs> so this calculation of the entanglement entropy now reduces to a calculation on a single CFT, uh, where <coughs> two sets of operators are beta by two separated from the other two sets of operators. <coughs> so now, <coughs> excuse me. So now we, one can calculate these correlation functions in a single CFT. The way to do them is, uh, you know, uh, by appealing to. Uh, uh, of course, there's a uh, there, there, there's a cross a cross ratio that would appear and. Uh, the cross ratio would have a t and a beta and uh, other dependencies uh, and, and the interval length dependencies in two particular limits where the time is less than half the length of the size of the interval that you have chosen and um, in the other case where the time is greater than this, uh, le this, this particular length, the cross ratio uh, can be taken to be either near zero or near one and so uh, in these two cases, either this twist operator is close to, oh, sorry, this should have, should have been a minus. Either this twist operator is close to this anti-twist or it is close to this. So this four-point function can be factorized into two, you know, two two-point functions in two different ways. Two sets of two-point functions in two different ways. And these two answers, uh, these two cases give you these answers. So what you get is that you <coughs> see that Till the time is less than half the size of the interval, there is an increasing profile for the entanglement entry, and it just saturates completely. Um, this is what you, you know, associate with thermalization. Uh, how exactly? We'll come back to that in the, in the case of uh, considering a single CFT. But uh, <coughs> but what is uh, what is going to be of interest is how this calculation reflects what, what is going on in the bulk. What happens in the bulk is that there are two cases uh, corresponding to these two channels that I just prescribed. Uh, if, you go to, if you use the Ruth Akayanagi prescription, then there are two sets of geodesics that you can consider. One set where uh, the, you know, the geodesics start uh, from one CFT and they run over to the other CFT joining the two endpoints, which would be like a sigma plus one joining a sigma minus two. Uh, it's a twist operator one joining a twi anti twist two, or, and the other case there are geodesics that start and end on the same boundary. Those are the ones that would not depend on time. The first ones are the ones that would depend on time. Um, but what? <coughs> so these are the geodesic configurations that are time dependent. Uh, so you start, you you take a. So these these are the kind of killing time slices that you have. You will will we are not considering these. We are considering the non-killing time slices because we consider t to be running upwards here and t to be running upwards here. We have chosen intervals which are, you know, here and here. And what we are now trying to do is to try is to try to replicate, uh, you know, reproduce the answers that we got in the CFT from the bulk. And from the bulk, they are reproduced by geodesics that sort of run from the right to the left via the interior of the black hole. And what is generally said, uh, uh, the, the way the interpretation goes is that the linear time rise that one saw from the CFT point of view is completely attributed to the rise of, uh, to the increase in the volume of the interior of the black hole. So all the interesting time dependencies uh, can be attributed completely to whatever is happening <coughs> in the interior of the black hole. And the increase in the size of the black hole uh, characterizes the increase in the entanglement of the two sides of the CFT. One way to, <coughs> you know, uh, one way to understand this is that the interior is completely made out of uh, the entanglement between the right and the left CFTs. That's one of the interpretations that go along with it. Anyway, <coughs> so these, this is the way to reproduce the calculations that were just done in the uh, CFT. Uh, what we did uh, in, in a paper in uh, 2013 was to uh, verify uh, the conjecture a little bit more. So one of the main concerns of the thermophile level state uh, which people had uh, you know, talked about was that perhaps it was a very, very fine-tuned state. Perhaps if you tweak the entanglement a little bit, the factor that's sitting outside, you will just break the entanglement between the two sides. But what we took in this paper, and there were a couple of other people as well, um, but uh, in, in our paper, we explicitly showed that if you, act, you know, if you add an angular momentum to this particular state, 
or if you add a U1 charge separately in this particular state, then this entire geometry remains intact. But now, you know, in the bulk, the corresponding modifications happen as you know the black hole would uh, ca be a rotating BTZ black hole corresponding to the case where there is an angular momentum, and it would have a, a flat U1 connection bulk if if it were uh, if if it had a U1 charge in the in the state in the CFT. Yes. So is that the bulk of the computer? Yes, so. <coughs> so the idea is the following. I mean, uh, I, I'm showing you diagrams of this entire bulk picture. I just wanted to uh, co explicitly show that there is a killing time slice of this kind. But really, <coughs> what is happening, if there is any non-local correlation function between the left and the right, that has to happen because there's a wave function that's sitting here or here, anywhere, you know, at, at a time symmetric slice, which is creating an entangled state in the bulk. So if, if I started with an eternal black hole of this kind, where there was nothing special that was happening at t equal to zero, all these correlation functions would not have been possible. They would all have been zero. But because I had a glued geometry to start with, uh, which was of um, this kind, that's that's what's making these geodesics run from the left, uh, running from the left to the right boundary possible. It's because there's an entangled state that has been created. The uh, the metric well because it's a time symmetric uh, you know slice I can just uh, open it up completely and then describe the whole thing by a Kruskal a set of Kruskal coordinates. That can be done. That we have done explicitly. So. So there's a, the metric is nothing new, basically. The Ru Taka and Agi Geodesics, yes. In a Lorentzian bulk, yeah. In, in the calculation, it just uh, sort of, uh, no, I, I, in the calculation, what we see is that, I mean, uh, uh, it provides you with the state in which you are calculating this. So the, in the CFT calculation, it's telling you what should happen. In the bulk, I don't think the, uh, it, the calculation really changes a lot. I, I, I think so. Of the length of the jets. But, but it's time dependent, of course, because it goes on. Yeah. Okay, so, um, all right, so, <coughs> so this was one of the generalizations. Uh, there was another set of generalizations that was made, uh, which was the following. Uh, in, in 2014, we followed this generalization. Uh, uh, <coughs> we generalized this thermofield double state by saying that, you know, you could uh, take unitary operators built completely out, out of the Virasoro generators here and act on the left and the right CFT independently, and what you would get is that you would get a thermophile double, uh, a modified thermophile double state, uh, but the entanglement would still be intact. Uh, one of the consequences that might happen of uh, you know using these sort of uh, unitary transformations is that in particular cases uh, you could um, have perturbations from you know starting from one CFT uh, that sort of back react on the geometry and do a lot of damage to the uh, geometry. These were sort of constructed by Shankar et al., but in the form of uh, operator insertions. Uh, what, we, what I'm saying is that it can be mimicked by these, uh, you know, uh, it can be mimicked by the action of these unitary operators on the left and the right CFT. Uh, <coughs> anyway, so, okay. So, so having said all of these things, what is the, what, what is the relation to thermalization of uh, e everything that's going on here? Uh, <coughs> one of the ideas that comes about is that you know entanglement NT is uh, a, a very effective uh, probe for thermalization. That that's one of the lessons that we learn here. 
in, in this particular calculation, one, this first in, the interval on the left hand side acts as some sort of bath for the interval on the right hand side. Uh, the saturation of the entanglement just means that um, the situation has the the, the 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 CFT on the right has reached some sort of uh, an equilibrium and it's completely entangled with the with the inter interval on the left hand side, and in the bulk it just means that the interior uh, you know interior of the black has uh, you know come up and it's sort of um, encoding all the entanglement between the left and the right CFTs. Um, However, to uh, connect to our original motivation of understanding collapsing scenarios, it would be nice if we could understand how to get uh, single-sided black holes. Uh, again, there was a proposal by Malda Senna that uh, there, are, there are many, many uh, uh, possible uh, orbifolds, Z2 orbifolds that you can do of the original uh, two-sided bulk geometry to get to a one-sided bulk geometry. Uh, one, one such uh, orbifolding is the one where you take the uh, Euclidean part tau and identify it with the minus tau. And so <coughs> as a result, what you get is that you get, uh, um, <coughs> you get this geometry. Th this should have been the one with, without the, um, I, I mean, this is just for illustration. The actual geometry is this. Um, <coughs> this is like an end of the world brain that's sitting here just because you've identified tau with minus tau in the, in the Euclidean section. And now it creates a wave function only along this part, and this is uh, 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 the, 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 what is interesting is the is the state that it gives rise to in the CFT in this particular case. The state that it gives rise to is um, said to be a fixed point of the boundary RG, and it, it's it actually turns out to be the Cardi Calabresi state um, that I shall define shortly. Um, <coughs> so <coughs> this is the this is the new one-sided black hole that we have obtained from the two-sided black hole by just doing a, an orbifold. Um, let me define what is going on on the CFT side corresponding to this. So uh, a parallel story uh, which was going on in the condensed matter um, uh, community, uh, which was being led by Cardi and Calabrese, uh, it started with a paper in, I think, 2006, and before that in 2004 as well, where they proposed that uh, if you take some sort of a gapped system and you quenched it, meaning that you change the you know, dimensionful parameter to zero uh, so that you go to a gapless system, then um, the ground state of the gapped system could be modeled by uh, this boundary state, that's, uh, which is conformally invariant, and <coughs> with this <coughs> particular cutoff uh, <coughs> with epsilon identified with beta over 4. Uh, what is beta is what we'll come to a little later. Uh, but um, basically, this beta is a, a, a sort of is a function of all the dimensionful parameters uh, which were present in the gapped theory. So this sort of a process is uh, what we call quenches. A very simple example of that is, suppose you start with some sort of a massive scalar field theory. And uh, very instantaneously, at time scales t much, much smaller than the mass present in the theory, you put the mass to zero. So what, you ha what would happen is that you would start from a massive theory and go to a massless theory very, very instantaneously. So that's what you call a quench. Uh, <coughs> what Cardi and Calabrese said is that uh, this quench state, which is basically the ground state of the initial gapped phase, can be modeled as some state sitting at the conformal fixed point deformed by uh, a relevant operator, which was the Hamiltonian of the CFT. Um, <coughs> it's not completely true in the case of the free uh, bosonic CFT, as was shown by Mandel, Paranjpe, and Sorokhaibam, but uh, that's a different story. We'll, uh, we'll not consider that. But uh, for most general cases, that seem to be true. Or the intriguing feature was that if you calculated the entanglement entropy of a single interval in this particular quench state, it gave you the same profile that you got uh, in the thermophile double state and also in the bulk corresponding to that. So uh, there was <coughs> there's definitely a <coughs> connection that was suggested even as early as 2006. This is a pure state. Did I not mention that? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, 
Why should it be a pure state? <coughs> well, um, I think this was more of a conjecture, but I'm not very sure how to argue physics-wise why, um, or I can argue why this state might appear in the sense that you know you start from some gapped phase and you're going to a gapless phase. So the state in the gapless phase must be some conformally, uh, you know, conformally invariant state. And this parameter is the one that en en encapsulates whatever the gap was. Um, well, this state, oh, I see, okay. No, it's my mistake. So generally, the assumption is that this is the ground state of the initial CFT, initial gap CFT. I think that's why it's a, it's a pure state. Uh, after the quench, uh, uh, this is not the state after the quench. What we are saying is that you know, this is the ground state of the initial CFT, but it can be written in terms of the modes of the Hamiltonian after the quench has been made. And in terms of that, it, it can be written in this particular fashion. This has been proved <coughs> for the <laughs> bosonic case, uh, but uh, this is a conjecture for you know quenches which might involve multiple parameters and so on and so forth. Right. You should not get a mixed state. No, that that. But but what I'm saying is I'm not. Ev No, what I'm saying is that you're not even doing the time evolution yet. You're just re writing the ground state of the initial Hamiltonian in terms of uh, the modes of the final Hamiltonian. So the pure state that way just remains the pure state because it was a ground. St it was a pure state to begin with. <coughs> is it okay? Uh, I, I'll, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I, I can explain a little bit better. But anyway, uh, so uh, what was seen was that the entanglement entropy in this particular state was also uh, a linear rise with a saturation. So that was suggesting some connections with the thermophile level and the eternal uh, black hole bulk construction already. Uh, in a paper in 2015, what we, um, we made precise one of Cardi's ideas about how to understand thermalization in these sort of states. Uh, the idea was the following, that uh, uh, if if there was a if if there was a quench that was modeled by a Cardi Calabrese state, uh, we wanted to understand how uh, how how to look at thermal values in this state. I mean, how to extract thermalization from these states um, of observables. And so, what we did was what is exactly done in case of calculating entanglement entropy. You define a reduced density matrix corresponding to only a subset of the degrees of freedom that are available, and uh, <coughs> Uh, and we defined, <coughs> and we <coughs> sorry, and we compared it with the dense, reduced density matrix for the same interval that you might obtain if the full system were thermal. Uh, what does this mean? This means that suppose I'm standing here and I have access to degrees of freedom only around me within a certain box, and the f r system is the full room. Um, after a certain amount of time. Be with all observ observations that I can make, if the density, reduced density matrix that is obtained from a pure state overlaps with the reduced density matrix that is obtained from a thermal state, with the measurements that I can make within this box, I should not be able to distinguish between whether the global system, uh, global state of the room is pure or whether it's thermal. That's the idea of quantum indistinguishability. And this was one of, well, it's not a conventional measure, but it, it, it surely gives you, uh, appropriately normalized, it surely realizes that idea. It just tells you that um, you know when you have access to only a subset of the degrees of freedom, then um, at large times, compared to all other, um, compared to all other dimensionful parameters in the system, <coughs> all measurements that you do would start looking thermal. <coughs> uh, 
it's a stronger statement than saying that it's uh, only a few uh, few body observables or a few uh, special macroscopic observables were thermalized within a given uh, interval because what you're saying really is that it's the entire density matrix corresponding to that interval that's going to the thermal density matrix and so any point correlation functions that you calculate you know within this small box all of them would thermalize that's the basic statement um, this was our calculation of course um, going back to the one-sided black hole geometry uh, of course, as I mentioned, the entanglement calculation uh, showed a linear rise and a saturation even with this state. And this was the proposed bulk dual for that particular state. And <coughs> Hartman and Maldasana had shown that, uh, showed that, you know, using geodesics of the kind that started from the boundary again, but now instead of going to the other side because there is no other side, these geodesics just ended exactly on the end of the world brain. And if you consider the time evolution uh, of these geodesics um, corresponding to a single interval, they would again give you the same profile of a linear rise and a saturation. So um, at the level of the entanglement entropy, this seems to be uh, the correct kind of bulk dual that you uh, have. Um, <coughs> a little bit more about the dual is that no, this Geometry is a time-dependent geometry because there is no killing vector present anywhere in the bulk. Uh, the saturation of entanglement entropy, as I said, happens because you know there are geodesics um, that flip from being uh, geodesics that are running from the boundary to the end of the world brain to kind of geodesics that sort of start and end on the surface itself. Um, exactly anal analogous to what happens in case of the eternal black hole. <coughs> the curious feature of these uh, uh, <coughs> black holes would be that any uh, local, you know, considerably local set of operators would thermalize because of the presence of uh, a horizon that you saw in this in this geometry, which was present here. So, if you calculate anything uh, corresponding to a very small subset of degrees of freedom, that would perceive the uh, perceive the horizon after some point and that would completely thermalize. And so the typical time scales for that are the time scales uh, around which you know you saw thermalization for uh, the entanglement entropy as well. So they are of order the size of the interval length. Uh, in this case, of course, there is no other system which is uh, uh, acting as a heat bath for this particular interval. But the degrees of freedom that are present in the system itself. So, uh, but but uh, nonetheless, the answer still depends only on the size of the interval that you have chosen, and not what is the bath uh, really. So, <coughs> one of the things that we did calculate in these sort of geometries is the rate of thermalization uh, of primary operators. So, you take away a, pr a scalar primary in the CFT in this particular state and you calculate uh, the one point function, what you would see that is that at large times, which I haven't mentioned, I'm sorry, but at times which are uh, larger than beta, L, and all other dimension, dimension full parameters in the system, this one point function would start looking like a thermal one point function. And there would be corrections uh, of this kind where you can sort of pick out the rate of thermalization. The rate of thermalization depends on the conformal dimension of the primary operator that you're using. <coughs> in case of, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, in case it's a, a conformal primary, um, this would be zero. But then the same statement would be true for quasi primaries as well. In which case, this would this object would be non-zero here. Um, these calculations were exactly matched with. Uh, the lowest quasi-normal modes that you would get if you had some sort of a scalar field in the background of a black hole in ADS-3. Um, so in that sense, um, these quench scenarios are sort of uh, kind of very, very close to, uh, or not very, very, but uh, kind of uh, qualitatively close to what, what might happen if you had a black hole in the, in, in the background. Yes, please.
optimization. Oh, it's there. Introductions. Uh, okay, so in this respect, although I wasn't going for this, uh, you know, to, to enter this, but what you can see is that even free scalar fields uh, considered in this sort of a scenario would thermalize where the thermal values would be characterized not by uh, uh, a canonical ensemble, which, which has just beta, but they would be um, you know, characterized by an infinite number of conserved quantities, or something called a generalized Gibbs ensemble. So in that sense, you know, even free bosonic CFTs thermalize. Uh, so th there's not really an interaction that is required for this to happen. Um, <laughs> That's sort of taking us in another direction, but uh, <laughs> yes, uh, well, uh, I don't, uh, okay, yes, please. No, yes. For this calculation, yes. Mm, why would you say that? Sorry. Okay, sure. No, there's no large C that enters here. No. no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's almost um, almost there. So, um, uh, okay, this is the slide that I was <laughs> talking about. Uh, you know, you can, we considered uh, um, uh, a quench to a CFT that uh, is uh, free. And then you will have an infinite number of these conserved quantities. And in that case, the, um, uh, the rate of thermalization would depend on all of these. Um, well, um, this looks a little bit complicated just because of the fact that this also in, in, in incorporates um, <coughs> quasi-primaries. For primaries, this form is a little simpler. These are the highest spin conserved charts uh, that, that come into the picture. Um, Okay, and mu mu n's are the these mu n's and beta, of course, is the temperature that you work with. But uh, <coughs> I mean, this thing is sort of uh, this sort of drives us to a connection with the highest spin black holes as well. Um, in the case of the high, in the case when you have just uh, the W three charge, um, you know, there's a calculation by Narayan. Which, uh, where he calculates the quasi normal modes corresponding to a, a high spin 3 black hole. And what, in, from our calculation, if you identify delta k with 1 plus lambda and q3k with this quantity and omega k is minus i omega k, then this is exactly uh, the, this, you know, f from this result, this is exactly the uh, rate of decay of this scalar primary in this spin 3 black hole background. Of course, there, there are no calculations that exist for a spin greater than three black holes, and so all the other results for all higher spin black holes, you know, quasi normal modes for all higher spin black holes remain at the level of a, of a prediction. Um, okay, so conclusions are <coughs> what we did was that we <coughs> studied the time evolved thermophile double state that is dual to an eternal black hole state which has a Euclidean section that's glued to it. Uh, the two-sided entanglement entropy, black, uh, entropy was uh, calculated from the CFT and from the Bull perspective with angular momentum, a U1 charge, and an arbitrary number of Virasoro generator uh, charges. Uh, the one-sided black hole was real realized from the eternal black hole by an orbifold. Uh, the Cardi Calabrese state turned out to be a dual to the one-sided black hole with a Euclidean lower half. The problem of thermalization uh, in quantum quenches uh, in CFTs was related to the problem of obtaining thermal expectation values in pure states, and the, the same was explained 
from the bulk as well. <coughs> Some discussions follow. Uh, the fact that in collapse scenarios, uh, the bulk effectively is stable, however, the CFT is still pure. These sort of uh, you know, calculations that we just mentioned give us an idea as to how to extract thermal physics from pure states. Uh, some calculations exist for uh, in calculating entanglement entropy in collapsing scenarios by Lopez and Bala Subramaniam. Uh, it would be interesting to understand the similarities and differences with the, with the ca calculations that we just mentioned. And uh, one of the open questions that remain is, uh, in, the, in the case of quantum quenches, where if you start with some sort of a finite system and then you quench the system, uh, the bulk dual for that particular case is not completely understood. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why this might be of interest, and uh, this we mentioned in one of our papers last year, is that uh, <coughs> because the quench actually gives you a boundary state, and now if you have a finite system, you would also have uh, you know, uh, finite spatial intervals. So in the Euclidean uh, section, you would get something like a modular parameter, uh, and which you can tune to, you know, in tune to get either close to an ADS, a thermal ADS geometry or a BTZ black hole geometry. So these kind of quenches uh, will give you a, you know, playground for understanding what's happening in black hole, black holes, and how, you know, how are they forming from pure states and so on and so forth. Um, that's all I have to say, actually. Thank you. Thank you.